special day. It is the first time that we will go live. We will have live streaming of our worship service this morning. And uh, if you are tuned in, I want to welcome our members who are home, worshiping with us in real time. So this is, uh, this is a special Sunday, and uh, we pray that as you are home, that you will experience the presence of God in a very real way. Welcome to you who are here in person. I do want to point out a few announcements. Uh, it is the time when we um, raise funds again for Orange Farm. Uh, this will run until Easter Sunday, and that is April 4. Uh, a $25 donation allows a child in Orange Farm to attend school for a full year. And that includes a school uniform. They <coughs> wear school <coughs> uniforms in South Africa. So if you haven't <coughs> donated and you are moved to do so, you have time till Easter Sunday, April the 4th. Uh, there will be an ice skating event today at 2 p.m. to 3.50 p.m. at the Capitol Arena in Clifton Park Commons. Uh, skate time fees are $6 and children under five, $4. Uh, street soldiers of Troy, canned chicken, canned tuna, canned ravioli, spaghetti, canned stews, napkins, toilet paper, and other items as they are in the bulletin are what needed at the moment. And uh, the Helping Hands Food Pantry, uh, they are looking for salad dressing, cookies, crackers, body wash, body lotion, and shaving products. Uh, please take note of that. Uh, let us now prepare to worship God.
Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For God is our God, and we are the people of God's pasture, the flock under God's care. And as we gather together, we know that our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. And now grace to you and peace from God Almighty and Jesus Christ, our Lord, through the powerful work of God's Holy Spirit. Amen.
people of God, let me remind you that the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. And therefore, we may confess our sins, knowing that God is ready to forgive, ready to start new with us. With that in mind, let us pray. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for your goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore he instructs sinners in the way. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. Relieve the troubles of my heart and bring me out of my distress. Consider my affliction and my trouble and forgive all my sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. people of God, hear these words of assurance from 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. Jesus himself bore our sins on his body on the cross, so that free from sins we might live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. I can proclaim to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that your sins are forgiven. God has accepted you and embraced you as God's very own. God has made you a new creation. And then the question is, how do we respond? How do we show our gratitude for God's love, grace, mercy, and forgiveness? These words from Matthew chapter 22 give us good guidance on how we are to live. Our Lord Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Amen. El Psalter reading is from Psalm 10. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. From the east and Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble. He sent out his word and healed them. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love. And let them offer thanksgiving sacrifices.
Good morning. I am happy to see all of you today. It's time for a word for the children. This week, our Bible story finds us back in the desert with the Israelites. I hope you remember a few weeks ago, we learned about these people led by Moses. They were very hungry, so God provided them with food every day called manna. Even though they grumbled and complained about life in the desert, God loved them, so he cared for them and provided food. Well, 40 years is a long time, and this week we find the Israelites grumbling because they are still wandering through the desert. Because of their impatience and disrespect for God, they have a new problem, snakes. The snakes bit the people and made them very sick, reminding them what real suffering feels like. The Israelites came to Moses to ask for forgiveness. We have sinned because we spoke against you and the Lord. Then Moses prayed God would remove the snakes and heal the people. God had pity on the Israelites and told Moses to help heal the people with a strange cure. He told Moses to make a snake out of bronze, kind of like a metal statue, and put it up on a pole. Now when the snakes bit them, they looked at the bronze snake on the pole, and they were healed. God used the bronze snake on a pole to save their lives. Strange as it may seem, there is a connection between Moses' snake on a stick and Jesus on the cross. Just as the serpent was lifted up on a pole, Jesus would be lifted up on a cross. Anyone who looks to him will be saved. Inside each of us, there is sin that separates us from God. We too complain and are not always grateful. This is disrespectful to God because God blesses us and loves us so much. The Bible says sin is almost like a sickness. We can do nothing to heal this sickness. It is as if we are poisoned by the snakes that bit the Israelites. But God provides the cure. He raised Jesus up on the cross, and all we have to do is look to Jesus. We look to Jesus, and we are saved. Let us pray. Dear merciful God, thank you for loving us deeply. Thank you for raising Jesus up on the cross and giving us new life. Because of what Christ has done, God has saved us through faith. May we always be grateful for the gift of salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please join me in the thanksgiving sentences. With gladness, let us present the offerings of our life and labor to the Lord. Thank you. 
<laughs> oh God, you are the giver of all good gifts. Help us not take for granted all that you have given us. Help us see our very lives as gifts from you. Help us trust that what you have done for us is not due to any merit on our part, but purely from your divine love and mercy. Open our hearts to respond to your grace with generosity. Bless these gifts and send them into the world to proclaim your grace and salvation to all people. Amen. Now hear the word of God. Our first reading is from the Old Testament, the book of Numbers, chapter 21, verses 4 through 9, the bronze serpent. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it on a pole, and whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. And then a reading from the epistles, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, from death to life. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath, like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not the results of work, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life.
And then our gospel reading, the gospel according to John, chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. This is the word of the Lord. Another bizarre story in the book of Numbers. Yes, the book of Numbers has some strange stories about a blossoming rot that bore ripe almonds, about water gushing from a rock, and there's even a talking donkey. And these are a few that come to mind. My least favorite one is the one we read this morning. It is about fiery serpents, or more correctly, flying fiery serpents. The Old Testament story is strange and disturbing because it plays on our very primal fear of snakes. Apparently, there was an ancient legend of the desert as a place of vicious and dangerous serpents, in particular, flying serpents. In Isaiah chapter 30, verse 6, we read about an oracle of a viper and a flying serpent. And in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 29, we read the following. From the root of the snake will come forth an adder, and its fruit will be a flying, fiery serpent. There's only one thing more terrifying than a snake, and that's a flying serpent. You see, the author connects ancient Israel's impatience and disobedience with God sending poisonous snakes. And these serpents are wreaking havoc, causing many casualties. And the Israelites approach Moses with a confession. We sinned against God and we sinned against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. And then we read that Moses intercedes for them. He prays for them. And then he does what God tells him to do. He makes a poisonous snake out of bronze. And he puts it on a pole. And when people look at the snake on the pole, they live. Even after being bit by these vicious reptiles. End of story. Not quite. The bronze snake on a pole makes a reappearance in 2 Kings. King Hezekiah succeeded King Ahaz of Judah. And Hezekiah was a good king who did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And one of the things that he did was to remove the high places. The high places were the places where Baals were worshipped. The other thing he did was to broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. And then in 2 Kings, we hear these words, For until those days, the people of Israel made offerings to it. The bronze serpent who saved their lives 
became an object of worship, of sacrifice. And the good King Hezekiah destroyed this bronze serpent on a pole. So Israel really did not learn at all. Instead of being distracted by the strange stories about serpents and questions about the nature of God who punishes people by sending poisonous snakes, let us rather focus on two major theological points in our text. The first one is that Moses intercedes for his people in spite of the harsh punishment. And the second theological point is that the solution for them to live is surprisingly simple and easy. They had to simply look at the bronze snake on the pole and they would live. As one theologian says, and I quote, Moses intercedes and God's sovereign power extends over the dangerous and sinister character of the desert. It is therefore not surprising that this story about the bronze serpent on the pole has been seen as a foreshadow, a foreshadow of what happened to Jesus in the New Testament. For both of these theological lines are picked up in the New Testament. And in his gospel, John picks up the story about the bronze serpent on the pole and he applies it to a much more significant event, namely Jesus on the cross. Furthermore, John builds on the story in Numbers and saying, and he says that Jesus being lifted up on the cross leads to life, and now eternal life. And then immediately after connecting the bronze serpent who saved the lives of those in the desert, John writes, what has become the most memorable sentence for all times. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. The reason why God sent the son is so well known that the meaning is often taken for granted. God sending the son stems from God's incomprehensible love of the world. That is for humankind. God bridges the chasm caused by humankind's sin. And the Apostle Paul calls this act of God reconciliation. From the time of Moses, through Paul and John, we see that human existence has always been a balancing act between life and death. But John and Paul go deeper into this theme by saying that the life that Christ gives is now eternal life. In other words, the life that Christ gives is not limited by death. The life that Christ gives is not limited by anything that has the ability to diminish the life that God has in mind. Paul says that we pass from death to life. And this new life, this new life through reconciliation is free. It is a gift of God. It is grace. John, who emphasizes God's love for the world, and Paul, who emphasizes God's mercy and God's great love of us, they agree that this divine gift is free. God loves humankind. And I believe that every generation needs to hear this, for we are a people with short memories we tend to forget easily. Furthermore, we like to think that we are worthy of God's love. We think that we deserve God's love and God's mercy. All of us know the expression that context is everything. This is also true for this best-known verse in the Bible. 
People often quote chapter 3, verse 16, and then they focus on the second part of the verse. They focus on this part. So that those who believe in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. And when one focuses on the second part, one makes God's love conditional. In other words, so the argument goes, God's love of humankind is conditional on whether people believe in Christ or not. Or said in a different way, God's love is dormant until it is activated by our faith. This, of course, would make our faith an accomplishment, a good deed that would pay for salvation. Our intuitive response is that our faith is the price we pay for our salvation. However, when you think about it carefully, you would see that this, if this were to be true, then the eternal truth that we are saved or that we are set right with God as an act of grace and not because of our own doing, this truth would become obsolete. It is then my faith that would force God to love me. It is my faith that would activate God's love. If this were to be true, then we would be back to the time before Christ where we have to work out our salvation through our good deeds. Verse 17, as a matter of fact, reinforce the reason why God sent the Son into the world. And the reason is very clear. Not to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. New Testament scholars point out that at the time when John wrote this, there was a movement called Gnosticism. And it was a very active movement at the time. And Gnostics believed that salvation was meant only for those who are able or capable of receiving salvation through Gnosis, that is, esoteric knowledge. So Gnostics back then believed that God's love was conditional it was conditional on my ability to understand through esoteric knowledge. John makes it very clear that God does not want the destruction of humankind, but the well-being of all of humankind and not just that of a privileged section of humankind. Now you may say that what about verse 18? Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do believe are condemned already. New Testament scholar Rudolf Schnockenberg is correct when he said, says, and I quote, the thought of verse 17 remains dominant throughout. God has no desire to judge. God's desire is to save. Unbelief is therefore self-condemnation. It would be the same as those people who were in the desert, bitten by poisonous snake, who refused to look at the bronze serpent and then suffer the consequences. As you can see, theology is nuanced, and often it is easier to simply say God judges people who don't believe. This view puts us on the right side and those who don't believe on the wrong side. The theological truth, however, is more articulate. God wants the world, all of humankind, to be set right with God. And if this is God's desire, then we as people of faith who love God should always approach everyone, friend and foe, as the objects of God's divine love. What does it mean? It means that I would approach every single person that crosses my path 
I would see that person as someone who is loved by God. If we are reminded that God loves her unconditionally, so much so that God sent the Son, the son into this world, how can I then not love her unconditionally as well? As Moses interceded for those in the desert, and as Jesus intercedes for us, we are also called to intercede for one another, for friends and foes alike. That is why Jesus, after all, says, love your enemies and pray for them. This theology is, of course, not unique in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul says it very eloquently in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. And then he says, by grace you have been saved. And then in verse 8 he says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. This is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not the results of works so that no one may boast. By grace you are saved. The gift of God, not the results of works so that no one may boast. Simple and straightforward words, and yet so difficult to live by. You see, the temptation is always great to see faith as my faith. Or my faith is bigger than yours. Then I see it as my accomplishment. And this view often leads to arrogance even within the church. I may compare my faith with your faith. I may consider my faith more or bigger than your faith. And therefore, I may think that because of my big faith, God must love me a bit more. It is a dangerous slope. And we have to be constantly aware of this danger. There is one more important aspect. Christian faith, in fact, is really simple. We are set right with God by God's doing. It is almost like simply looking at the bronze serpent, not an accomplishment, not very hard. But yet it calls for a lot of courage. Let me repeat that. Being a person of faith calls for courage. Can you imagine looking at the bronze snake, keeping your eyes on it in spite of these vicious vipers biting you? hanging on your leg, distracting you. So it calls for courage to walk in faith, knowing that I am set right by God because it is God's doing. It depends on God. You see, our natural inclination, our natural inclination is to value things that are hard to accomplish, things that we work hard for to earn, we are raised and indoctrinated that everything that is worth anything needs to be earned. We need to work hard to deserve it. And now the gospel teaches us that the most precious gift of all, the love of God, the gift of Jesus, cannot be earned. It is free, it's a gift. But this gift enables us to live without fear, without prejudice, without hate. Because in Christ we see divine love. And when we receive this divine love, this divine gift, we want to respond with deep gratitude. We want to serve God. We want to love others. We want to live jo with joy and kindness. There is also a real comfort connected to this theological truth. 
There is comfort knowing that God loves me and God loves you. There is comfort knowing that God loves you on the days when your faith feels strong, as well as the days when you feel you have more doubt than faith. There is comfort knowing that God loves me on days when I feel on top of the world, and God loves me when I am down, wrestling with the meaning of life. When we embrace this divine truth of God love, God's love of us, we will also never give in to the temptation of worshipping bronze serpents or worshipping golden calves or any other idols that presents themselves to us as the solution to life's problems. Because we have, after all, received the love of God in Christ. Amen. now affirm our faith in the living God and we do so in the words as they are in the bulletin. We are God's stewards. We belong to Jesus Christ and to each other. We are not ashamed of the good news about Christ. He is God's powerful method of bringing all who believe to celebrate the victory of his life, death, and resurrection. We believe we are involved in the struggle of life and death. We choose life. We affirm it. We believe the triumph of God's way is assured. We are building on God's plan, and we believe it reveals the life that God would give to all. We are confident that God will give us enduring worth. We are ready to live and die in Christ's love for us. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Loving God, we give you thanks for your patience with us. We are sinful, stubborn, and selfish, and yet your love of humankind remains. We rebel against you. We ridicule our neighbors. We reject rights of our enemies and refuse to give others a second chance, even as we demand freedom and respect for ourselves. Open our eyes to see your grace, our ears to hear your forgiving words, and our hearts to accept your divine will for our lives. We thank you, God, for your word, written to inform us of your will for your people, Especially we are eternally grateful for your word who became flesh to show us once and for all your de deep divine love for all of humanity. We thank you for Jesus who reconciled us with you and with each other. Help us and guide us to keep our eyes on him so that we may live our lives with gratitude, pur purpose, seeking and doing what is right, uplifting and just. We pray for your world, O oh God. As the pandemic is still raging and thousands of people are dying every day, we pray for those who have lost loved ones, those who are sick, those who have lost hope. We continue to pray for deliverance, O oh God. We pray for your presence and comfort. 
Hear us as we pray for people we know and love. Carolyn Cromer, Dave Gordon, Doug's father, Craig DeRusso, Shona Hamilton, Bill and Janet's daughter-in-law, Sharon and Bob Ryder, our homebound members, and everyone who has been affected by the pandemic. We pray for all refugees, victims of natural disasters, war, and violence. We pray for your church. Forgive us as it seems as, as if she is often more interested in power than service, complaining rather than comforting, pursuing status rather than self, being self-sacrificing. We pray for our church here, O oh God. We thank you for our collective ministry. Continue to use us as instruments in your hands to bring hope, doing justice, loving kindness as we walk humbly with you. Be with us, O oh God, this new week. Open our eyes to see opportunities to do good, to love others, to provide a gentle word to those who are hurting. We thank you for your promise to be with us always as we continue our journey towards the light, the life, and the joy of Easter. We pray this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying in one voice, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
please rise for the benediction. People of God, we are reminded that God's love of all is unconditional. Let us go in this, into this world remembering that, and then let us love everybody because they are too loved by God. And as you do so, may the grace of God, the love of God Almighty, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.